It's loud, it's massive, and it refuses to die. The Boeing B-52 Stratofortress has been flying since the 1950s and against all odds, it's still the backbone of America's long-range strike power. Its secret? Those massive, unmistakable wings. They're what keep this Cold War relic alive in the 21st century, lifting nuclear payloads, outlasting generations of bombers, and redefining what endurance in the sky truly means. The B-52 was born at the beginning of the nuclear age. In 1946, the U.S. Army Air Forces called for a bomber that could fly 8,000 miles and strike deep into Soviet territory with its nuclear payload without the need to refuel. Boeing's earliest designs were based on turboprop engines, but as jet technology matured, engineers shifted to eight turbojet engines mounted under long and swept wings. This meant the B-52 would be faster and longer range than anything before it. The prototype, the XB-52, flew in 1952. By 1955, the first operational models entered service. The aircraft was placed under Strategic Air Command, where it became the hammer of America's nuclear deterrent. It was designed to launch from U.S. bases and deliver nuclear weapons on intercontinental missions. Crews trained constantly, and the B-52 became the visible reminder of American power. The bomber was ugly to some eyes and beautiful to others. Ultimately, it earned its affectionate nickname the Big Ugly Fat Fellow or Buff. The wings carry eight engines and four twin pods, originally Pratt and Whitney J-57 turbojets. This layout was chosen to distribute thrust evenly across the long span. Each of these produced about 10,000 pounds of thrust, giving the bomber enough power to lift 185 tons of steel and ordnance. Later models adopted TF-33 turbofans, which improved efficiency but still left the buff burning fuel at a staggering rate. For decades, the Air Force studied re-engining but kept the TF-33s in service. Now, the B-52J upgrade will replace them with modern Rolls-Royce F-130 engines for service in the 2050s. Even on the ground, the size of the wings posed challenges. Special hangars had to be built to house the bomber, and the wing's span made taxiing tight turns a delicate task. Before moving forward, here's a question for you. Why has the U.S. Air Force chosen to keep upgrading the B-52 instead of replacing it with newer bombers? Drop your guesses in the comments below and we'll share the answer at the end. The B-52's wings were designed for efficiency above all else. With a high aspect ratio, they generate tremendous lift while keeping drag low. This gives the Stratofortress a lift-to-drag ratio far superior to most heavy bombers of its time. That aerodynamic choice meant the buff could never reach supersonic speeds like later bombers such as the B-1 Lancer. Instead, it was optimized for high subsonic crews, so it was able to fly thousands of miles with a heavy payload while burning less fuel per mile. The 35-degree sweep back balanced stability with speed and allowed the aircraft to cruise comfortably at Mach 0.85. Perhaps the most dramatic feature is the bending and flexing of its wings and turbulence. From the cockpit, pilots often describe watching them flap up and down like the wings of a giant bird. But it's far from a weakness. That flexibility actually spreads out stress and protects the structure from cracks. The B-52 could haul up to 70,000 pounds of ordnance. Its internal bay and wing pylons carried nuclear bombs, gravity bombs, cruise missiles, mines, and even experimental payloads. During the Cold War, this made it the backbone of the nuclear triad. It offered intercontinental range and massive payload and gave the U.S. credible striking power. In Operation Linebacker 2 or the Christmas bombings of 1972, B-52s dropped thousands of tons of bombs on North Vietnam. Today, the same airframes carry precision-guided weapons like JDAMs and long-range cruise missiles. The adaptability of the payload bay means that a 1950s-designed bomber can still launch some of the most advanced weapons in service. The B-52's endurance depends on its fuel, and much of that is stored inside its wings. Together, the bomber can hold over 47,000 gallons. This massive capacity allows flights of 8,800 miles without refueling. But that's just the beginning. With aerial refueling, the buff's range becomes virtually unlimited. During the Cold War, bombers could stay aloft for entire days and were always ready to respond. The wing-integrated tanks also balance the bomber in flight. Fuel is shifted between tanks to maintain stability as weapons are dropped or fuel is consumed. The design keeps the jet level, even as thousands of pounds disappear from its structure. Q 
Keeping wings this old in service isn't simple. The B-52 fleet has been flying since the early 1960s, and the wings have absorbed millions of hours of stress. To keep them airworthy, the Air Force carries out constant inspections by looking for cracks and signs of fatigue in the massive aluminum structure. Reinforcements such as thicker wing skins, strengthened spars, and redesigned attachment fittings were added during service life extension programs. These ensured the wings could safely carry thousands of pounds of payload for decades longer. Upgrades have also extended their usefulness. Hardpoints under the wings were redesigned to carry cruise missiles and precision-guided munitions. Fuel lines and tanks have been modernized to work with aerial refueling systems. Today, work is underway to fit the B-52J with new Rolls-Royce F-130 engines. These will replace the 60-year-old TF-33s, delivering better fuel efficiency, lower emissions, and quieter operation. The upgrade will extend the bomber's life into the 2050s. Over time, the B-52's wings became carriers of electronic defenses. Later variants of the Stratofortress were equipped with electronic warfare pods and sensor systems mounted along the wings that gave the bomber the ability to survive in increasingly dangerous skies. These pods housed radar jammers and communication disruptors that could detect enemy tracking systems. In practice, this meant the buff was actively confusing and deceiving air defenses. By scrambling radar signals and disrupting communication networks, the bomber could shield itself and its formation from surface-to-air missiles and interceptors. When Boeing built the B-52, no one imagined its wings would still be flying nearly a century later. The airframe was deliberately overbuilt, with conservative stress limits to handle the massive payloads of early nuclear bombs. In the 1970s and 80s, fatigue testing revealed just how strong those wings were. Even after thousands of simulated hours, they showed far more durability than expected. This is why the Air Force was convinced to keep them in service. Service life extension programs reinforced them further with redesigned fittings and new materials, and allowed the bomber to carry heavier and more advanced weapons. In effect, the B-52's wings were given new lifespans every generation. That structural resilience is why the same aluminum wings designed in the early Cold War will still be flying missions in the 2050s. The B-52's wings may look old-fashioned, but their design explains the jet's unmatched longevity. Unlike the B-1 Lancer, which uses variable geometry swing wings for supersonic speed, the B-52's fixed high-aspect wings were optimized for efficiency and payload. They didn't make the aircraft fast, but they did let it carry more bombs, more fuel, and fly over a farther distance than its sleeker successor. The B-2 Spirit has a stealthy blended wing and is harder to detect, but far more expensive to build and maintain. By contrast, the Buff's long, straight wings have proven adaptable, supporting everything from nuclear bombs to cruise missiles to electronic pods. In a world where other bombers have been retired early, the B-52's wings remain proof that endurance and adaptability can outlast even speed and stealth. The B-52 has spent decades breaking records. In 1957, three B-52s circumnavigated the globe in just 45 hours with refueling support, setting a benchmark for global reach. During the Gulf War, it executed combat sorties lasting more than 35 hours. It was also one of the first bombers to integrate cruise missiles, giving it the ability to strike from hundreds of miles away without ever entering enemy airspace. And then there were the unusual tests like carrying the X-15 rocket plane, experimenting with nuclear-powered missiles. It even launched experimental drones. Each mission proved the B-52's wings were versatile. Culturally, it became a Cold War icon. In films like Dr. Strangelove, the B-52 symbolized both the absurdity and the danger of nuclear brinkmanship. To this day, it's instantly recognizable. Big, ungainly, and unforgettable. The B-52 Stratofortress should have been a historic artifact long ago. Instead, it became a legend. Its wings carried nuclear weapons and guided precision bombs over battlefields for nearly 70 years. And about that question from earlier, the B-52's frame was built to last, its wings to lift generations. It's more feasible to keep the B-52's perfection alive and efficient with upgrades rather than spending billions on a new model. If you enjoyed this journey into the wings of the buff, hit like, subscribe for more stories of aviation history, and tell us in the comments, what do you think keeps the B-52 flying? Its engineering genius or sheer stubbornness? 
How would a jet so big even lift off the ground? That's what people thought when the Boeing 747 was built. A giant in the sky, this was a jet that revolutionized aviation and made air travel accessible to people. Its engineering and design stand as stories of bold ideas that turned into legend. In the 1960s, the world was changing fast. Air travel was booming, but jets like the Boeing 707 and Douglas DC-8 could only carry about 150 to 180 passengers. Pan Am's visionary CEO Juan Tripp saw an opportunity. He wanted to design a plane twice that size but keep ticket prices affordable to make air travel accessible to the masses. Boeing's answer was bold and risky at the same time. The company poured billions into a new aircraft program so expensive that it nearly bankrupted them if it failed. Chief Engineer Joe Sutter and his team of The Incredibles had just 28 months to design the 747 from scratch. The result would not only change Boeing's future but reshape aviation itself. At over 230 feet long and with a wingspan of 196 feet, the 747 was more than double the size of any contemporary jetliner. It introduced a wide-body, twin-aisle layout, making boarding faster and cabins more spacious. It was so revolutionary that Boeing had to build an entirely new factory in Everett, Washington, the largest building in the world by volume, just to assemble it. Airlines wondered if the jet was too big while airports scrambled to lengthen runways. But once the 747 took flight in 1969, it became clear that the world was ready for a new queen of the skies. Building the 747 required breakthroughs in almost every area of aviation engineering. Pratt and Whitney developed the JT-9D engine, which was the first high-bypass turbofan used on a wide-body aircraft. Each engine produced around 46,000 pounds of thrust. This was enough to lift a maximum takeoff weight of nearly 735,000 pounds. The wingspan of 196 feet had leading edge flaps, Kruger flaps, and massive trailing edge flaps to generate lift at slow speeds and allow the heavy jet to take off and land safely. The landing gear was another marvel. 18 wheels spread across four main bogies and a nose gear that distributed weight evenly and allowed the jet to operate from runways that weren't originally designed for such size. Inside the structure, engineers added multiple redundancies like triple hydraulic systems and reinforced fuselage sections. It was designed to be robust and reliable for flights lasting 10 to 14 hours. No other plane looks like the 747, and the reason is the hump just behind the nose. Originally, this was less of a style choice and more an engineering necessity. What airlines did with this extra space behind the cockpit was where magic happened. Pan Am and TWA turned it into glamorous lounges that had spiral staircases, piano bars, and fine dining. A seat upstairs meant luxury and signaled aviation's golden age. Over time, airlines swapped the lounges for business class seats, eventually creating the premium cabins we know today. Still, that ceiling and layout gave the upper deck a private jet feel. For frequent flyers, sitting upstairs on the hump became a bucket list experience. Before we move forward, let us ask you a question. Why did Boeing choose a hump instead of making the 747 a full double-deck jet from the start? Drop your guesses in the comments and we'll get back to this at the end of the video. From the very beginning, the 747's cabin set it apart from every other aircraft. Its twin-aisle wide-body layout was a first in aviation and created a sense of space that earlier jets couldn't match. The ceilings were higher, the aisles wider, and the rows stretched farther than passengers were used to. Boarding the jumbo jet felt like walking into a hotel lobby rather than an airplane. Airlines were quick to make use of this space. In the 1970s, upper deck lounges became icons of glamour. Downstairs, galleys the size of small restaurants prepared hundreds of meals for transoceanic flights. Over the years, the cabin evolved with technology. By the 1980s and 90s, airlines began installing personal entertainment systems, replacing shared movie screens with individual seatback monitors. Business class transformed into lie-flat seating while the quiet upper deck offered the most exclusive experience in the sky. Later, mood lighting and advanced air circulation systems gave the cabin a fresher, more modern feel. In its earliest years, the upper deck was an exclusive lounge. Airlines like Pan Am marketed it as a flying penthouse, complete with cocktails, chandeliers, and leather armchairs. As passenger demand grew, airlines converted the space to seating. By the 1990s, it became home to business class, featuring reclining sleeper seats and personalized service. 
The upstairs cabin's quiet atmosphere and unique layout made it highly desirable. For some travelers, flying upstairs on a 747 was more than just a seat, it was a rite of passage. Climb into the cockpit and the scale shifts again. Early 747s required a crew of three, captain, first officer, and flight engineer. The engineer monitors fuel and hydraulics on long-haul journeys. Rows upon rows of analog dials and switches filled the instrument panels. By the late 1980s, the 747-400 introduced a glass cockpit. Digital displays replaced most of the analog gauges and the flight engineer's position disappeared. Now, only two pilots were needed to fly the jet. Yet, no matter the version, pilots say it felt like commanding a giant. From a cockpit 30 feet above the ground, they had a sweeping view of the runway. On takeoff, the 747 felt less like an airplane and more like piloting a moving city. For flights lasting up to 14 hours, the 747 had to take care of both passengers and crew. Cabin pressurization systems kept air breathable at altitudes above 35,000 feet. Oxygen masks were ready in case of emergencies. Climate control balanced temperatures across the huge interior and ensured comfort despite frigid conditions outside. Hidden above the main deck, crew rest areas gave pilots and flight attendants bunks for long journeys. In the galleys, ovens, refrigerators, and coffee makers kept thousands of meals flowing. All these features along with flight attendants kept the experience smooth and served hundreds of passengers with precision. Few jets were as adaptable as the 747. Over five decades, it evolved through multiple generations, the 74700, 200, 300, 400, and finally the 7478. Each variant introduced longer range and more efficient engines. Airlines upgraded interiors and reconfigured entertainment systems and seating. Cargo versions kept flying even as passenger fleets retired. The design's modularity ensured the jumbo remained relevant, even in a changing industry. This adaptability is why the last passenger 747 flew as late as 2023, over 50 years after its debut. The 747 moved the world with its massive capacity and reduced fares. Suddenly, families could cross oceans affordably, and people could reach opportunities once out of reach. Airlines built their identities around it. Pan Am, British Airways, Singapore Airlines, Lufthansa, all became global icons in part because of their 747 fleets. The jet also served as a flying symbol of diplomacy. Air Force One turned the 747 into a presidential command center and inspired similar state aircraft worldwide. Freighter versions transformed trade. With a nose that swung open and a cavernous main deck, the 747 carried satellites, engines, racehorses, and relief supplies to disaster zones. It was as vital to global commerce as it was to passenger travel. When it entered service in 1970, the 747 instantly claimed the title of the world's largest passenger jet. It was the first commercial jet to cross the Pacific non-stop and set records for passenger loads, with some airlines squeezing over 600 people into a single flight. And its range of nearly 8,000 nautical miles allowed for journeys like New York to Hong Kong without stopping. The Jumbo also played starring roles in history. NASA used modified 747s to carry the space shuttle across the United States, creating one of the most iconic sites in aviation. Air Force One, a specially outfitted 747, became the Flying White House, carrying U.S. presidents on diplomatic missions across the globe. And in popular culture like Hollywood films and novels, the 747 became known for intercontinental travel, the Boeing 747 was a revolution in its own right. It shrank the world and became a symbol of human ambition in flight. Though production has ended, its legacy remains etched in aviation history. For millions, the queen of the skies will always be unforgettable. About that question earlier, the hump existed so the cockpit could sit above a nose that swung open for cargo loading, so the 747 could function both as a passenger jet and a freighter. If you enjoyed this journey inside the world's largest passenger jet, make sure to like the video, subscribe for more aviation stories, and share your own 747 memory in the comments below.